We're here with Kem Kumba, he's the executive curator of the Next Science Science Forum, and he'll be providing us some details about the content, uh, the scientific process of the, the, the scientific program committee, what's expected, and, and some other topics of relevance in, of science in Africa. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Uh, so on the topic of, the, of science, I asked this question uh, a few minutes ago to someone else, but what is the state of science in Africa? Before we even talk about um, what we're expecting and what we hope for, what's the baseline in your opinion? What's the outlook? So uh, the outlook for science in Africa can best be uh, seen in comparative terms because Africa doesn't live in isolation. So you c I, I can best approach it by looking at how science is in Africa compared to, say, Asia or Europe or the Americas. Mm -hmm. And when one looks at Africa, it's the continent of 52 countries. Within Africa as well, there are variations by country and by regions in terms of uh, their scientific uh, um, uh, activity. Uh, Africa is not as uh, strong as uh, other parts of the world, say Europe and, and Asia and, and the uh, and, and the Americas, and it's, it's, I should be very careful about that because even in the Americas, North America is strong, but South America, some countries are strong and some are weak. In Asia, some are strong and few countries are still a little weaker. But Africa as a whole, collectively, still is not as strong as other regions collectively. Um, South Africa is relatively strong in science. They will be hosting the Square Kilometer Array the premier uh, uh, telescope that will be existing on Earth that's very, uh, that pays for really advanced uh, science. science Africa, um, uh, South Africa was uh, once a nuclear country. It's uh, where one of the first uh, heart surgeries were done. There's a rich history of that in, in Southern Africa. Nigeria has been advancing very, very strongly, uh, engaging very, very advanced scientific activity. Ghana and uh, Kenya, mostly the Anglophone countries in Africa, they've been making a lot of progress. So uh, compared to other parts of the world, Africa hasn't been doing very well or investing much in science and developing an infrastructure and the enterprise. But within Africa itself, if you look at it in the last 10, uh, 10 to 20 years, it's made tremendous progress. And that progress is measured in a report that the World Bank recently put out uh, in August in collaboration with Elsevier Publishing that shows that uses uh, the amount of uh, publications registered in Africa to give a sense of the evolution of scientific activity in Africa. And you can see very clearly that the number of publications has increased tremendously. The number of collaborations that African scholars have with the international uh, partners has increased tremendously. Uh, but that's a little bit uh, superficial because why one can measure uh, progress in science through publications, if you look on the ground itself, the filtering of, the public, of what is published into concrete solutions for African problems, that part, has not that part is, still, uh, is still lagging. The existence of infrastructure to give Africa a scientific base, to give Africans space to do their own science with or without international partners, but, uh, just in internally, that part is lacking. And a good example that would give a sense of where Africa stands in science related to the rest of the world or within itself would be the recent Ebola crisis, where just the fact that somebody had a disease and it couldn't be controlled because it was a communicable disease, and it couldn't be controlled by the country's scientific enterprise, the scientists, the infrastructure, the doctors, uh, the reaction was more alarming. And the uh, increase in infection rate was so much that it destroyed whole regional economies. And the rest of the world, the media, everything played us, uh, played Africa, as though they are unable to manage a simple disease. I say simple because Ebola is not the worst that ever happened in the world. It's bad in terms of the death. That's not what I'm talking about. Communicable diseases will be arising. Our environment is changing and inducing uh, viruses that didn't exist some years back in our in global space. AIDS once came around. It, it wasn't there prior to uh, when it came for millennia when uh, that, uh, humans have existed. AIDS came around. And Africans were, were still uh, put at the center as originators of the AIDS uh, epidemic, but they were the least able to contain the disease. 
uh, and then... Uh, but to interrupt you there, yeah. on a practical level, if you were to say uh, within the, 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 the for, uh, this, within um, discussion around the next Einstein forum and how it will be different from all the other science forums that are happening, what can be said about some of the changes that are required for better science to happen? So that's exactly what I was getting at. While Ebola couldn't be contained, look, for the, look at the US for example, the virus, the flu, kills tens of thousands a year, but it's not a pandemic because the US has a big scientific enterprise. In order for science to advance in Africa and be able to assist Africans control, manage their own diseases, their own environment, their own matters arising, they have to invest in their own science infrastructure. They need their research labs so that they don't have to take the, uh, the samples outside of Africa. They need their own highly trained doctors who can do, um, or uh, scientists who can do the, uh, who can uh, research on, on, on the uh, samples right on the spot. Yes, certainly with collaborators from outside maybe, but at least be able to manage it internally without things that are sometimes, I would say, inevitable. Because in a few years, I don't know how long more can predict, some of these things again would arise. How do you still manage it? So having the infrastructure to contain it is the, is the, main, is, is the main thing. The next Einstein Forum would be a platform where these issues of how Africa manages itself, the scientific tools that it needs to manage itself, would be discussed. And the impediments to its ability to develop those scientific tools or the opportunities that, that exist for it to develop those scientific tools, those things will be clarified beyond politics, beyond science, beyond just speculation. But we'll bring all these communities together on the same table and look at what obtains in other parts of the world, look at the history of science in the world, look at what are Africa's strengths and weaknesses, both its politica political institutions, its higher education institutions, its uh, research institutions, its financing mechanisms, its civil society's attitudes towards science. Those things we put in, in a global uh, context and hopefully out of it, good friends who want to assist Africa, and Africa on its own who already wants to develop its own uh, scientific infrastructure will be able to better position itself to develop the science that it needs to handle its own problems but also contribute to the broader global scientific landscape. On the question of, of um, existing uh, publications, as yes. you said earlier, publications are not the only indication that uh, things are going well because uh, uh, the same report was discussing that most of these publications are done in collaboration with external partners, exactly. uh, ex external researchers, and that these emerging countries, for example, in Southeast Asia, are much more ahead than Africa, even though we started at the same level, if you look at the progress. So one can take the bleak version of what's happening in Africa, um, and one can take the positive version of what's going on in Africa. But on, on a positive level, we can come to the understanding that young people are the future in terms of science. And there are many initiatives on the continent. And I think uh, what my question is around is, how is the Next Science Forum going to showcase young scientists? Unlike many other fora that you really get um, uh, senior scientists come and discuss the most cutting edge science, the Next Einstein Forum would be a broader platform that would bring these senior scientists, but also policy makers, and put them around young African emerging scientists. We will select 15 or so leading cutting edge African scientists that exist out there. We've done, we've done a call for, for submissions and we'll do, we're doing a selection. That's part of why we're meeting here this weekend. We'll do a selection, get the best African scientists, put them at the center and let them lead or participate in the discussion of Africa's future. Partly because like any other part of the world, when you talk about development, talk about empowering the youth who, who need to understand what is needed as they grow up into leadership roles, mm -hmm. as they grow up to play roles in, uh, in, in society. And Africa's role is even more pertinent. Africa's position is even more pertinent because one, the discussion is coming up stronger and stronger about the youth dividend. Mm -hmm. Call it the youth board, the youth time bomb, or the youth dividend, as, as you will call it. It will be one of those three, a bulge, a time bomb, or a dividend, depending on how these youth are placed at the center of any effort at developing, at advancing Africa. 
And so we, the forum will bring the 15 of the best African scientists that we can find, put them at the center of discussions about policy, about society, about their role as the future, as those who would develop those scientific solutions that would address African problems for Africa itself and contribute to the broader global enterprise. They have to be empowered. Africa also happens to be facing a, a peculiar problem. Um, uh, the, if you look at the, uh, the, our universities, we have an aging professorial class. They need to be replaced by more youthful and energized, or at least avoid a vacuum, a more youthful and uh, energized um, uh, faculty. Those have to be done, not, in, not in abstractly, but by actually positioning the younger scientists at the center. So we will bring young folks. The next Einstein Forum will be centered about the young, best African scientists. And then the other conversations will revolve around them. So even when our political leaders talk about science, they should be seeing the faces of that science, not in abstraction. If people want to support African science, they should be seeing those faces of African science. It's not something that you talk about in abstraction. Those young folks have to be the center of our activity, and that's what we aim to do. On, on, as a follow-up on, on that, on two questions. First, there's a lot of talk about science policy. Yes. Uh, the African Union has set out its document on the future of science policy, or at least what we want as a continent, so STISA 2024. There's a passage by the World Bank, so there's a lot of documents talking about science policy. But a lot of, of body of research also criticizing the science policy. But what is your idea of, of best practice science policy, and, is, and in what way will this be discussed in the forum? The forum at a, at the policy level, it would look, it would do a review of all these policies. The, every country's quote unquote development ag agenda to become an emerging country, as they're calling it, has a strong scientific component. Many of our, our just about every African regional economic community has a scientific agenda. AMCOST, the World Bank, the uh, African Development Bank, every African leadership institution has talked about science. But the conversation about science has not been matched by what they say they will do. So there's one level of saying conversation, putting up a call, putting up a, a, a declaration of intent on what should, be do, uh, what should be done, and actually going from intent to doing it. Africa has its own institutional and material conditions that sometimes make it hard to go from idea to practical outcomes. We will put an accent, a focus, on that distance between intent, everybody has goodwill, everybody has ideas, but what outcomes? And how do you go from A to B? That is what we want to focus on. Not so much just talk about policy and make more declarations and have more ideas put out there, but come up with a roadmap. Other parts of the world, as you mentioned, Asia, that has uh, emerged, as I call it, or as they're emerging, they didn't just put out policy documents. They went, the policy documents were foundations for what they did. Documents in Africa have not yet been used to deliver what they said they will be delivered. For example, the Abuja Declaration of a few years ago by African head of states. They declared themselves that they will each commit their country to dedicate at least 1% of their GDP to science and higher education. They declared they haven't done that. What are the challenges between declaration and implementation? We don't want to criticize. They have the good intent. But what, what were the difficulties of going from intent to practical outcomes? That's where we want to see how the, the conversation can assist the African governments and African institutions go from intent and idea. Ideas exist, many of them. You can copycat, you can adapt ideas from many of them uh, from, from other parts of the world. Or you can have your own homegrown ideas. The key is going from idea and intent to the outcomes that you desire. It's a long distance, and it's not very obvious how to get there. That is why many African countries haven't done it yet, but that's where we'll put the accent. Okay. On the question of, uh, obviously, here you're talking to the leadership of, in Africa, and also the global leadership uh, as, as it's looking to Africa. The question also arises around industry, the private sector. There's a big emphasis right now uh, because of the growth uh, in African economies. Everybody's looking to make their economies more competitive. Uh, industries are coming, big names are coming into Africa. Uh, big tech companies are coming into Africa. 
the question arises, what, how will we have this interaction between science, scientists, mm -hmm. leadership, and industry? So how will this science become, um, I would use the word commercialized, or at a point where these ideas can be turned into something, and this, uh, these ideas can now be used to transform African society? Already, by the mere fact that the next Einstein Forum will bring these three parties, policy, scientists, and the private sector, the corporate uh, sector on the table, is already a game changer. It hardly exists on the continent. Those three communities, not just individuals like who, who know each other, but as communities, hardly ever come together. For, for the corporate sector to understand the role of science in enabling them transform their own products, improve upon them, and get better profit margins. The private sector hasn't seen yet, or had a conversation, to see how they can use the university higher education system, invest in infrastructure to train the manpower that will support their own corporate growth. Partly because many African big corporations, the base of their wealth doesn't come from technical skills. So they haven't seen that yet. Extracted industries, when they want technical skills, they get expatriates from outside at a much higher cost. That analysis has, hasn't been done. If you were to hire an expatriate from the US or from Europe or from Turkey, it costs three to five times more than hiring someone trained locally. And that money goes outside, out of the continent because they're paying an expatriate to, to, to take it back. They haven't seen that analysis that they, they rely, relying on expatriate, few of them, one, doesn't quite give you the larger critical mass of technical skills, and two, doesn't leave the African youth and population itself less, uh, I want to say, uh, uh, less sophisticated to use advanced products. So having that conversation between policy, um, corporate sector, and higher education, just put them on the table. We don't have all the answers. We don't run the corporations here, we run all the universities. But that, that has to be a three-way conversation. And the civil society has to see where their role, where, where they come in. Just having those three or those four or five different constituencies on the, on, in the same forum, talking and saying, here is where we complement each other for our mutual betterment. Sure. That is a key. NEF, the next Einstein Forum, doesn't pretend that it has answers, but it pretends that if you bring the key players whose interests are at stake on the same table to look at where they complement each other, like business partners, you will see different outcomes. That is how it is done in other parts of the world, where commercializing university products is not a big problem. The commercial sector already understands it. And so they pick it, not because they're doing a favor to the university or to the government, for their own corporate benefits. Take, for example, if, if, if I may, um, uh, Mention is made very often of someone like the, the uh, Dangote group and their cement factory. How do you improve cement and the whole construction industry? If you think of that question, it's a scientific question, it's an engineering question. But if you are able to improve maybe 1% on cement properties, better durability, use less cement and, and, and build more, our own temperate zone, he, they might be making lots of money now because there's no competition. But if you have to improve on that product, and even increase the profit margin. It's about developing the scientific skill that will do that. Look at our telecommunications industries. Phone, uh, very often, phone lines you hear, you know, they're busy, they're not going on very well, uh, there are hitches here often. Well, why that? If you have to Im improve upon that nuance and that, the fluidity of the communication system, it's a scientific problem, it's a mathematics problem. Get more technical skills, advanced, to give you the most cutting edge solutions to solving that problem. Other parts of the world where technology seems to be more common, things seem to work better, it's only because they have more technical skills to address those issues. If African corporations would improve on any of their products or their services to their own market, their customers, they have to rely on technical skills, to not only low level technical skills, very advanced, African trained technical skills to improve on those products. It increases profitability, it increases the marketplace, it increases Africa. And the governments on the other part, whose mission is to uh, look out for the welfare of their population, 
get a better society altogether. On the, on the point of, of science that uh, answers uh, development questions, that uh, responds to the challenges, there's, it, there seems to be a discussion very much around manpower, which is important, technical manpower. But it seems that to me the, the idea is lost that even for the future of the, the global industry, on the future of the survival of the planet, we need people who come up with new ideas. And can you speak to that and how it relates to our young people? Yes, here's how I, I see that. Much of Africa's, much of the policies that African countries develop are still policies that are pushed upon them by develop, international development agencies, be it the World Bank, be it the United Nations, be it the stronger partners from the North, be it the bigger funders who support all the civil society. They come with their external ideas of what should be good for Africa. And they come with good intent, but their vision of Africa is when they're coming to help Africa. And when you're helping somebody, you, you assume that they are weak and incapable. The difference will come if Africa is able to stand up and define its own agenda independently, so that when they meet the development agencies from outside, or the partners from the North, US, Europe, Asia, and, and the others, they don't meet them to ask for a handout. They meet them as a partner. They mutualize their relationship. They don't get into unilateral relations where good intent from outside skews your own development. The way African countries can actually get our issues is to look internally for their own manpower. It would lead them to redefine the issue. Africa's problem is not about sustainable development. It's not about transfer of knowledge. It's about development of their knowledge. It's about advancing their own welfare. Not sustainable issues like survival, barely making it. That is what it brings. But the way sustainability is an externally constructed um, um, uh, notion. If Africans were to stand and look within themselves, the leadership, civil society, and scientists, what do we need? What do we want for our next 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Like, uh, uh, um, uh, like Madam Zuma has done at the African Union with the Vision 2063 I mean, in other spheres. That vision is, is, done, is put together. You will see that the word sustainability is not, a, is, is not an issue. The global scientific community is at, is at uh, crossroads. Look at demographics. Science flourishes where there is a the youth energy and the youth imagination. The youth are the ones who imagine, who dream, who see things that no one else sees and goes after them, who are adventurous with their lives. And they are, they are free, uh, unlike a more aged society, where they are more set and they can celebrate their, their, their successes. Africa is the youthful population of the, has the, the, uh, the world's future youthful population. Europe is declining, so is America, and so are other parts of the world. The scientific enterprise is at a point where it's benefited tremendously from the European culture that has enriched it for in the last couple of centuries. It's benefited tremendously from the American melting pot, as they call it, where many different communities come together and they create a scientific enterprise. It's now moving towards uh, Asia, and China is coming in with a different cultural perspective. Now, when those cultures have exhausted their ingenuity to dream and look at the world from different perspectives, Africa is the next frontier where if you have to imagine different worldviews that can look at the same picture but interpret it differently. The cultural constructs that makes you to look at one thing and define it differently from a European or from uh, an Asian. That is what matters now for the future of science. So if you want to think about the future of the planet and the youthful boy is coming from Africa and Africa has a different cultural construct to the way they see things than the way others see uh, uh, the, uh, the traditional scientific countries have seen, uh, have seen the reality. Then Africa is naturally the next incubator of the future of science. That has to be seen not only as an African problem, but as something that would be extremely beneficial to the future of science. The last question I have for you is around diaspora. Yes. Africa has a huge uh, diaspora across the world, some who have left to pursue research uh, and, and uh, academic opportunities because the resources or the environment has not been available in their countries. So now we have a huge diaspora uh, and uh, now many have returned to the continent, some are still wondering 
what, not that it's, it's, it, it, you, you can be useful to, the, to your country or to your continent, wherever you are. But can you speak to the role of the diaspora and how NEF is going to engage them? Here's how uh, we envision NEF uh, addressing the, the diaspora uh, issue. Many diaspora conversations now center around African immigrants. Those like myself who were born on the continent and migrated outside to live in the US or elsewhere. You look at diaspora programs by countries, you look at uh, by different countries, uh, they look at the, uh, you look at diaspora programs by international institutions like the, the World Bank and, and the UN. They are thinking of how to make people like me who live in America send money home, contribute to home development. It, they're looking at the recent immigrants. Africa itself, on the other hand, the African Union, defines its diaspora as all people of African descent who live outside of Africa. And it's a much stronger and more valid definition. And here is where NEF comes in to take on the African Union's definition instead. One, that's how Africans themselves see the diaspora. They don't see those who, have, who left through slavery and, in, and, and since then as non-diaspora. The Africans themselves see this as their diaspora. And it has huge implications. One, from the colonial, when Africa was colonized, cut off from the rest of the world by colonial forces, they had difficulties. They resisted the colonial period, but they had difficulties seeing beyond their boundary. It was the diaspora that could see and come help them out. Pan-Africanism comes out of the diaspora, from Sylvester Williams in the Caribbean over to uh, Du Bois in, uh, in, in, um, in the US. Even Kwame Nkrumah had to travel to the US to make contact. Kwame Nkrumah actually got his education that came and transformed Africa and gave us independence from his contact in Brooklyn with the African American. That's Africa's diaspora. When you look at uh, negritude, there are two main currents that have dominated African intellectual and political um, uh, structures in the last 50 years. One is Pan-Africanism, come from the diaspora. Two is negritude, that um, uh, the opposite of Seda, Seda Segor and his Caribbean diaspora colleagues came up with. Those two things are what have dominated Africa for the last 50 years, governance and humanities. We are now talking about sciences. That diaspora still exists. America, in, in the US, for example, where I, I'm, I'm very strongly familiar with, there is a strong African immigrant diaspora. There's an even stronger African global diaspora. The African American is one of the factors that we will engage. They participate in the leadership of US um, scientific institutions, both academic and, 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 and political. They are in Europe, they are in the Caribbean, and they have the emotional instinct. They are emotionally closer to Africa than anybody else you can think of. That is the diaspora. They are a huge pool of reserve that we will be engaging to say, look, fellow African diasporans, it was you who brought Africa, Pan-Africanism, and helped it free itself from, uh, from colonialism. It was you who brought in negritude and helped Africa redefine itself after uh, its humanity after colonialism. It is you who still has the obligation to come back to Africa in this new era and help it establish a strong scientific enterprise. That part has to be engaged. We don't want to be caught up in narrower definitions of saying, look, it's just the African who was born here, yes, uh, in in, in, uh, yeah, on the continent and move over to the US or to, the, to Europe, who should send money home, who should come and collaborate with a student. That part is there. We encourage that. We'll put all of this on the table. Africa says its diaspora is global. That is Africa's voice. And the rest of the world should better listen to Africa if they are truly for Africa's interest. Because Africa cannot be saying that it's our diaspora, and when you develop programs that you intend to support Africa through its diaspora, you neglect the African American. It doesn't serve very well. It is paternalistic, it distorts Africa's own interest. So when the dominant forces from outside look at Africa and do not, and do not depart from their own definitions and their own constructs, you distort Africa's development. For example, at this meeting that we're having, uh, this uh, committee that we just had here for the NEF, the NEF Scientific Program Committee, we have one of the leading African-American scientists, Professor Philip Clay. This is a guy who has been the chancellor of MIT. Should we put him outside of diaspora conversation because he wasn't born on the continent? That is somebody who has led one of the strongest 
uh, research uh, institutions in the world. That's Africa's resource, even out of science. So we would enlarge the discussion. We don't have answers directly, but we will, we will help amplify Africa's voice on what it wants with or out of its diaspora, be it brain circulation, be it any uh, uh, brain transmission, be it um, uh, return to the continent, whatever mechanisms we use. China has a diaspora that it's tapping into. Israel, you always say about Israel, it's for its energy, it's not even the state itself, it's a diaspora, you hear that very often. No other region of the world has really, really made it from an impasse without using the diaspora that has seen the world from beyond. We want Africa to, to see that in terms of its scientific future. As you can tell, the discussions are going to be very interesting at the next Einstein Forum. Uh, it's going to be held in Senegal, and we look forward to it. Obviously, we'll be discussing more along uh, the year, and we'll have more discussions with scientists. Uh, but definitely, we, we look forward to having uh, a scientific uh, forum, but mostly about how science impacts society, how it's going to drive uh, Africa's development and transformation. And we, we really hope that with young people at the center, there's going to be a different uh, environment and different mood at this uh, next science and forum. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much. I very much look forward to it. It's going to be a very exciting conference. The world hasn't seen anything like this yet. Believe me, they haven't seen it yet. They haven't seen Africans come together to talk science and their society and their future. Science originated on the continent, so yes. that's something that uh, is lost oftentimes. Exactly. And the title of the forum is Intentional, The Next Einstein. Where would he come from? How would you even dare think of Africa producing Einstein? Look at the world that produced Einstein. That world was worse than Africa today, some time ago. If you look at Germany, where Einstein came from, it was, uh, there was a point in history where it was worse than Africa, than Africa, but it eventually produced Einstein. Look at the Europe that has produced all these big scientists. At some point, it was worse than Africa today. It eventually produced all those big names we read in, in, in many books. So Africa is just on its own historical path. And the next Einstein will look forward to coming out of Africa's youth dividend.